So, tonight's topic is Attract an Amazing Life, which you already have, and Instant versus Gradual Manifestation. I just want to remind everyone that I have um, I've categorized my whole teaching under three teaching categories. And I'll just very briefly go through them. I don't know why exactly, but I just feel like giving you that context today. So in my academy, for example, I teach two ways. So there's the way of self-realization and the way of self-actualization. And I understood there's some confusion for some people about that. So the way of self-realization contains my first two teachings, which is, I call them enlightenment and infinity. And the way of self-actualization contains my third teaching, which I call empowerment, which is what I'll talk about uh, today. It's in, in line, is in line with that, the manifestation ideas, the, the principle that you are constantly communicating with your creation and that this is indeed your creation, that this is indeed your chosen world, and how to become more conscious of that and how to be able to more consciously and harmoniously interact with yourself in that way. My first teaching, enlightenment, is all about, and you can follow me as I speak, relaxing into that which is already here. What is that which is already here? It's you. It's I am. It's I exist. It is I am aware that I exist. Who here does not exist? Can you raise your hand? Who here is not aware that they exist? Raise your hand. Good. So you're enlightened. You just completed my first teaching. Very well. Took me two years <laughs> to get this one down. And I'm pretty fast, so congratulations. My second teaching, <laughs> um, there are some subtleties to that teaching, but um, this is just a very brief synopsis. And in the academy and somewhere on Facebook, but this is a while back, you can find this diagram. Um, I call it the self-realization index or the map of self-realization. And it shows you this way of self-realization. It shows you all these different stages from the um, I am person, the sense I am a person. And one step back would be I am, without the addition of the person. And then even deeper is the recognition that the I is that awareness which is aware of the sense of am, the sense of being. So roughly enlightenment consists of these two, these two super subtle, beautiful, eternal aspects of your being, which is awareness and presence or beingness. So in the I am, there is the I or awareness, being aware of the fact that there is an isness of a certain kind, that there is a presence. The presence is the M, the I is the awareness. The I is the awareness, the I is the awareness. So we learn to relax into the recognition that we always exist no matter what happens, no matter what changes, no matter what comes and goes. Nothing has beingness of its own. It's all given beingness by the I am that's always here, always now, always already what we are. It's always already our direct experience. You can't change being aware of I am. There's no other way to be aware of any experience but through the I am. And then we rest, in a sense, even deeper. We relax even more and we recognize that there is this subtle, super spacious, infinite aspect of our being, which is aware of I am. It's aware of the beingness aspect. It's aware of the presence. Right now you're aware of the presence that's shaping itself in the form of my voice and your body and the sensation of sitting in your chair. All of these sensations are all generated out of the beingness, the presence, energy aspect of creation. But there is an awareness of all that. Then the second teaching is called Infinity, in which I share that it's, although this is not relevant for everyone, because it's not exciting to everyone, but it is possible for you to realize that beyond awareness, there is the infinite. There is source. There is the one. 
there's the absolute. Awareness itself has, what's going on here? The awareness itself has some kind of presence to it. It still has isness. There is awareness being. It's emptiness being versus presence being. I am is presence being. Awareness is emptiness, spacious being. But it still has some kind of a being, some kind of a presence to it. Does that make sense? There still is awareness. You can say awareness is. There is an isness. It's recognizable. You can notice that you are aware. Which means that awareness is actually not infinite. It's still finite. It is infinite in its scope, perhaps, but it's not infinite in the fact that it cannot cease to be itself. Awareness cannot stop to be aware. And in that sense, it has a limitation. Just like your skin or your body cannot stop being its body, awareness cannot stop being awareness. So it is a creation. Even awareness is a creation. It's the subtlest creation in creation, but it's, it's the first expression of the infinite, of the one. It's the means through which it can know itself. It's its, it is its free will, its free agency. The, it's the infinite in potent, in potent form, in, sorry, in actionable form. It has a workable form to it in the state of awareness. But we can realize that as we rest as awareness, and there is this sense of spacious, free consciousness. We can ask ourselves, what was here before awareness occurred? What existed, in a sense, before there came about awareness? What is there beyond awareness? What would there be without any awareness whatsoever? And if this sinks in for you, if this drops in, if it happens to be relevant for you, then it is like resting, resting as awareness or resting in the sense of consciousness is like becoming the sphere that contains the whole universe, the principle, that spacious free principle within which all appears. So it's like you become aware of yourself as the very boundary of the universe itself, the sphere that holds it all together as an experience. But then you ask yourself, what is beyond even the experiencer of experiences? What would happen if this bubble popped? And if it's relevant for you and it hits home, it's like you're being sucked into a vacuum of sorts. You re realize suddenly that Nothing ever actually happened to you as the absolute. No awareness, no experience, nothing ever occurred. In a sense, it's instant healing. It's instant cleansing of all experiences you've ever had. Because you realize that on this absolute level of myself, nothing ever happened. And when you start to realize that and bring that into your experiences, while you're experiencing all kinds of shit or things, you can start to more and more bring in an awareness of what's beyond awareness or an awareness of infinity or an awareness of absolute untouchability or an awareness of nothing ever happened to me as the absolute. You can suddenly more and more bring that sense, that understanding, that knowingness with you into everyday experiences. And then you have that beautiful simultaneity of experiencing things, feeling things, perceiving things, working on yourself things, not working on yourself things, resting as awareness things, being hurt, feeling pleasure, feeling joy, and while simultaneously having an awareness that there is that ultimate aspect of your being, which has no knowledge whatsoever of what's happening right now. It's oblivious to it. It's completely oblivious to what's happening right now. And it's very peaceful to have that understanding with you while shit hits the fan, right? So it gives you a great sense of indestructibility, of infinity, of timelessness. And awareness can do this too. Presence can do this too. They all have their different degrees and variations and shades of immortality. But this is the one that existed before life began. So in that sense, it's the most timeless. That's my second teaching. It's called infinity. 
The third teaching is called empowerment, which falls in the academy, it falls under the way of self-actualization. And so when we have realized, not that you have to go through this first, you don't have to, but let's say that you go through it as I went through it, step by step, and as it's laid out in the academy, you will realize through this freedom, through this infinity, through this immortality, having that stability of beingness and even the beyondness aspect realized, having that at the core of your understanding of yourself, then suddenly what's left to do? but enjoy yourself, but create, but empower, but share, share benefits. This is the only thing that remains, is to naturally overflow, is to naturally empower yourself, and through that example, to be a beacon for other portions of yourself, to recognize that and choose however they wish to respond to that, whatever they want to take from that or reject from that. But the more you shine, the more you help other portions of yourself, the rest of yourself, reflect upon themselves and make choices and get to know themselves a little better. So at some point you realize the true simultaneity of all these levels of existence, of the fact that it goes all the way from nothing ever happened down to the nitty gritty, we are in a relationship, I don't feel good right now because your hair looks like shit. All the way down to that level, there is the true simultaneity and everything in between there happening um, my girlfriend gave me a haircut today, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> this was not based on real experience, but it could have been. Um, so that's just a beautiful, like that's, that's as far as I have. I keep developing myself, just to give a little background, I keep always expanding and developing and empowering on all these different levels of my being both in the way of self-realization as well as in the way of self-actualization. But there is sort of an end station, which is not even the absolute. I used to think that the absolute is the end station. And in a way it is, because it's very final. But the end station so far has been what I call true simultaneity. It's the most, quote-unquote, and not to really speak in levels or anything, but sometimes people ask me, what's the most advanced realization that you know of? if you have to define that in such a way. And I would have to say it's that of true simultaneity. In other words, it's neither this nor that. There is no one answer. It's the true simultaneity of everything. That's pretty much where it ends, in a sense. That's pretty much, there's nothing beyond true simultaneity in that way because true simultaneity, by its very nature, includes everything simultaneously and everything is equally validated as being an equally valid portion of creation or non-creation. So it's a very complete center to rest in, to be in, to be realized in, if that makes sense. So teaching three is that of empowered consciousness or empowerment. And in this teaching, the way of self-actualization, it's all about empowering yourself. What does it mean to empower yourself? It quite literally means to remember what is true about creation and what is not true about creation. Forget what's not true and remember what is true so that you start to live as you are actually created, as the image. Being created in the image of God is a quite literal statement. You as an I am individuation of the all that is consciousness, that is the expression of the infinite. You as an individuated I am portion of that overall consciousness, of that overall creation, has been created, have been created in the image of God, in the image of the infinite, in the image of awareness, in the image of the one. And you are endowed with infinite intelligence, with infinite power, with infinite inseparability, with infinite connection to all the rest of yourself, which is infinite, which is endless. So empowerment simply is it's very closely aligned to the way of self-realization. It's just in a different direction. It's It's... It's worded a little different. But in self-actualization, what you're actually doing is through, through contrast and through contact with your direct experience with your own creation, through contacting that, through being in the direct observation of this is my creation, this is my experience, and what am I learning from this, you are practicing what it's like to be an individuation of the I am consciousness, consciousness in a conscious way more and more. And as you practice what it's like to be a conscious individuation of the all that is consciousness, 
you will start to meet certain challenges, you will start to face certain ideas, and you will start to unravel more and more of both your individual as well as the collective unconscious mind that you have agreed to be a part of and that you have given your power away to. And so empowerment means to more and more consciously meet your direct experience, your own creation, because that's what this is. You have created this because there's no one else. So that's all of that. This is your creation. And so through meeting that, through making contact, that's how we learn. Like how does a baby learn to walk? It bumps its toe into a rock and it falls over. It makes contact. It, it creates friction. It is through friction. It's through the meeting of consciousness with its generated creation, with its experiences, that it, it's, that it meets the reflection of its own choices, of its own vibratory state of being, so that it can get to learn itself through this constant friction. How do you make fire? How do you generate fire and brilliance? Through rubbing two stones together. Friction, contact. So empowerment is gained through contact. And we all have constant contact with our direct experience. We can't escape it. You cannot not experience this moment. Even though on the absolute level, you're not experiencing this moment. But simultaneously, you are. And you can't say that you're not. So it is through this contacting of your experience all the time, especially when you start doing it consciously, attentively, with care, with desire, with intention, with the desire to learn, with the desire to expand, with the desire to create in greater alignment with your true self, to be of greater benefit to yourself and the rest of yourself. So through this contact, through this contrast, we learn. We reflect upon ourselves. We start to feel ourselves. We start to experience ourselves. We start to gain greater consciousness, regain greater consciousness of who we are and how creation works. And so we empower ourselves, or we disempower ourselves, because friction, since it is challenging by nature, since it faces us, we are then forced to look at certain unconscious aspects being brought into consciousness. And this is what happens all the time. This is what meeting your direct experience is. It's literally seeing a portion of your unconsciousness made manifest so that it becomes conscious. Now many of us flee from this, run away from this, even become spiritual and rest this awareness away from it. That's not empowering, unless you don't use it in that way, unless it's not motivated by fear for pain and fear for experience and fear for fear. So now that you know you're immortal, eternal, suddenly consciousness opens up to meet its experience and accelerate its learning process and its self-expression process. So now what has been infused, the theme that has been infused into this, shall we say, lifetime, starts to accelerate. You start to learn the lessons more rapidly. You start to embody and expand more rapidly. This is what I call acceleration in general. And there's many facets of this, but in general, acceleration means that you are learning and reflecting more and more consciously. The more conscious you are of each moment, the more benefit you're extracting from your own creation of the unconscious being made manifest so that it can become conscious. Does that make sense? Normally I get more response. <laughs> so does it not make sense? Does it not make sense? Anyone? It gets a little confusing. Uh-huh. Okay, was it, shall I repeat it, uh, summarize it, and slow it down a little bit? Okay. No, no, that's good. I'm sure that this will benefit more people. So, you see this, right? This is your experience and you're meeting it right now. Can you say that you're not? No. So you're meeting this experience. You can't escape your own creation. Every single nanosecond, you're recreating your creation in a certain way to teach you something, to show you something. Manifestation could also simply be called reflection or um, the showroom of your unconscious mind. This is your unconscious mind made manifest all the time. Does that make sense? So you're always interacting with your unconsciousness, 
through this very physical, tangible level of your consciousness, which we call physical manifestation. It's an immediate reflection of who you are. It's a mirror. It's showing you your own face. It's showing you more of your whole being. But it's showing you in a way that is conscious to you. And, you know, of course you can deny it and you can avoid it and you cannot be as conscious of it, so then it remains in the realm of the unconscious. But practically speaking, if you pay attention to this moment, this floor is conscious to you. No? You're conscious of the floor. You're conscious of my words. This means that you are communicating with yourself as we speak. You are right now communicating with yourself. Your unconscious, which is really your superconscious, it's simply unconscious to you, but it's not unconscious in its own self. It's superconscious in its own self. The unconscious is above your consciousness, not below your consciousness. So the great unconscious, which is superconscious, and sees way more at the same time than you do, you only pick things apart consciously, which is part of your theme as a human being. But the way that this greater self communicates to you is through, one way it does so, is through physical manifestation. This is how it makes itself visible to you. Does that make sense? So through your learning experiences, through your relationships, through your businesses, through your job, through your career, through your anything, anything that's part of our everyday situational, physical, relational life, we communicate, we, re we see, we perceive our unconsciousness in a visible form so that we can start to become more conscious of who we are as a vibrational being of consciousness. Everything is a reflection of your vibratory state. Your vibratory state, for most of us, is a largely unconscious. The majority of it is unbeknownst to ourselves. So empowerment, again, is to become more conscious of what we're sending out all the time. And one way to do that is to start to learn from your physical manifestation because it's your unconscious vibration made visible to you, communicating to you, knocking on your door. Hello, this is what you look like on the inside. Does that make sense? So the physical manifestation is the unconscious mind made conscious, or ideally made conscious, if you pay attention, if you want to. But it's made visible, at least. So this is how you meet yourself all the time. There is no physical reality, not really. You're just meeting with yourself all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah? Good. So this is a constant stream of communication. It's a two-way communication between one being, which is a paradox, I agree. But it's a two-way communication within one being, within one individuation of the one being. We could say it's your lower self and your higher self communicating, if you want to call it that, just for the sake of clarity. But all the time you're communicating with yourself, you're learning from yourself. What was the theme of this talk again? <laughs> I, oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Attract an amazing life. Instant versus gradual manifestation. Okay. So I kind of made sense that I shared that just now because it helps you understand the balance of instant versus gradual manifestation. Some of you may be here purely and solely because you want to accelerate the creation process of your life, the changing process of your life. You want to attract an amazing life, which is great. I applaud you for that. I, I appreciate that you care about your existence, that you care about your expression of consciousness. So that's good. Instant manifestation is the case all the time. Did you see any gradual movement to create this table here, or was it simply there? So every manifestation is an instant manifestation, because in fact, as some of you who have come here more often know from my teachings, is that you're actually consciousness shifting through different slides, different configurations of the universe you are not literally creating or manifesting anything physically, structurally speaking. It's not possible. Because from the point of view of consciousness, the absolute consciousness, shall we say, there is no time. 
Imagine that for a moment. There not being any time. There not being any time. There is no time. If there is the absence of time, then everything that can exist already has to exist. You can't create anything new. It all exists. 20,000 billion years from now is already here. Any alternate reality configuration of what we would call, from our position here in this universe, 20,000 billion years from now, exists right here, right now. It has to because there's no time, and everything that can exist does exist. So it already exists. Where does it exist? inside your consciousness. How amazing. Infinite creations exist in one central meeting point, and that meeting point is consciousness, the free agent, awareness, you. And you, as your I am individuation, are pouring a portion of yourself out into a particular linear, seemingly linear reality. And so your consciousness moves through a particular understandable logical sequence of parallel universes all the time. Every second you're doing this millions, billions of times. So fluently, so fluidly that you don't have any idea that half of the time you don't exist. Every other nanosecond, nothing is here. And then every other nanosecond, there's another frame, another configuration of energy another configuration of creation showing up inside your consciousness. Now, if you do this a billion times every second, like a light switch flickering on and off a million times or a billion times per second, how would you know? But once you get this, it starts to make sense because movement, you start to instinctively know that movement is an impossibility. Change is not possible, structurally speaking. Change is not a possibility. Something that is cannot become something else. It's impossible. Very logical. Maybe not yet, but at some point. It will be very logical. that Something that is cannot become something else. It's impossible. A frame will always be that frame, and every parallel reality is in a timeless stasis. It already existed before you had any awareness of your sense of self. And it will always exist 20,000 billion years from now. It will still exist. Every reality you've ever experienced and every reality you will ever choose to experience because it's relevant for you to experience that reality already exists right here, right now, parallel to each other inside of the I am here now consciousness, which you share in, which you are ultimately. Something that is cannot change. Yet we experience change. We experience movement. How is that possible if something can change? It's because we're not actually changing what is. We're shifting through an alternate configuration of what seems to be here, which implies that every nanosecond you have a 100% completely different body, and there's a 100% completely different sun, and there's a 100% completely different Milky Way galaxy that you're conscious of. Like a projector light shining through the pictures that together form a motion picture. It's not a movie, it's pictures in motion, although the pictures themselves are not in motion, but it generates the illusion of motion through pictures. Picture, 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 picture. Right now you have a 100% different body. That's the only way you can change. You can't grow your hair. It's not possible. You can only shift to a body that has a different configuration of the length of its hair. Like I said, your unconscious is hyperconscious. It's superconscious, because that's what's taking care of all this. So you might be wondering, shit, I'm pretty intelligent. For me to move through all these alternate parallel realities, and while I'm focused on my relationship with something or to something in this world, seemingly lost in a sense of separation and illusion and circumstances seeming real, simultaneously, I manage that every billionth of a second, I'm moving into a parallel configuration of this universe where my body has a slightly longer 
structure of hair. That's pretty amazing. And that's just one aspect of the things that you constantly regulate. So what we call the unconscious is really superconscious. Does that make sense? And this is what is, or we could simply sort of generally call it the higher self or higher consciousness. And it is what is generating our reality in the way that we are generating our reality. It is what is regulating our agreements. It is what is deciding what is next and what is next and what is next so that you from your lower self point of consciousness can actually be the participant in your own creation, seemingly separate but not really, seemingly the receiver but still actually the giver to itself so that it can then focus only on the play inside of the stage and it doesn't need to worry about the stage itself. The stage is set. You can change the stage, but the stage is taken care of for you. Gravity is here. It's all regulated. The way your hair grows, etc. The earth orbiting, shifting through all these parallel realities that then seem to form a linear causal reality is all taken care of for you and it's providing you with the stage you need to play out your individual theme so that you can learn, so that you can express yourself from a very limited point of view, but the expansion you gain from meeting from a limited point of view is massive. In a way, we could almost say that the more consciousness limits itself from its lower self point of view, the more it seemingly becomes this individual in a play, even though from a higher point of view, it's regulating the very universe that it exists in every billionth of a second. From this point of view, the learning that is extracted adds to the expansion of that soul consciousness, the I am consciousness, that is at the core of your individuation. We could call it soul. Does that make sense? Yes? You can change the stage, yes? You do it all the time. Uh -huh. Sure. So she says she's confused about the concept or the paradox about the stage is already set and you can't change what is and you can't. Right? <laughs> the stage is taken care of for you but every billionth of a second it disappears and it reappears in a similar state. Does that make sense? So it n it's never set in that sense. You just, because it's relevant for your experience to be in a similar reality, you keep automatically generating a similar reality that looks very much like the previous parallel slide of the universe. But it, nothing is, in that sense, set. Now, if you as an individual, you, uh, you as a, shall we say, lower self, is, is learning at an accelerated rate, for example. There's different ways to change the stage. But if you're learning at an accelerated rate and you're actually extracting all the benefit that your soul wants you to extract from that particular stage, you at some point reach a point of renegotiation, of reviewing while you're still alive. Now, if you're really, really slow, this won't happen until you die. But if you're fast, this will happen multiple times throughout your single life. What I'm talking about is that as you are learning and extracting benefit and you're, you're developing the theme that you're here to develop, as soon as you reach sort of an end of a particular lesson that your consciousness wants you to learn, as soon as you've learned pretty much all that there is to learn about that, you are very much back in the creator's seat. You are back in that neutral space in a sense of like, hey, I've completed one chapter. What would I like to write next? What is this particular life conducive for in terms of another type of lesson, another type of theme? Or it can be a subsection being added, being infused into this particular lifetime that is part of the other theme or an extension of the other theme or an expansion, an expansion pack of your previous theme. But in that sense, I mean you can change the stage. Does that make sense? That would be great. Thanks.
Yes, and is that, um, is that change not already on some level set as well? Like if 20, 20 billion years is already here, if there's no time, is that change not already, already oh, here? Oh, I see. Okay, let me clarify. <laughs> Thank you. Did everyone hear a question? Okay. So I mentioned 20,000 billion years from now already exists. Oh, how am I going to say this? Um, 20,000 billion years from now is a thought we have here and now. From the point of view of consciousness, it's not 20,000 billion years from now. It's now. So it's parallel to now. What from our agreed upon linear causal logical reality seems to be 20,000 billion years from now, got it, got it, got it, got to your consciousness, it's right now. So there is no time. Future is not set in stone. All that there is, is the now containing infinite parallel realities. Which means that in your experience of time, 20,000 billion years from now, you can experience any single one parallel reality that is relevant for you to experience. So your 20,000 billion years from now, in your timeline experience, even though it already exists, does not have to be the one that I mentioned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's parallel, it, it, there is no time. So you're all shifting through a parallel reality all the time, and you can choose, your consciousness chooses, your whole being chooses what to move into next. Now from its own point of view, you can say there is years and there is timelines, but from consciousness, there is no such thing. It's just moving from this picture to that picture to that picture to that picture to that picture. So there's no saying what in your experience may be the illusion may be generated of 20,000 billion years. I've been around here for 20,000 billion years. You may generate that illusion, but that has just been your subjective experience throughout shifting from this reality to that one, to that one, to that one. You feeling like, oh, I've grown so many years shifting through all these parallel, parallel realities. But there is not a single slide, there is not a particular configuration of the universe that actually exists 20,000 billion years from now. 20,000 billion years from now does not look a certain way. It can look like this moment to some other being. Or it can look like this to you if for some reason 20,000 billion years from now in your subjective experience of time, self-generated, which is not real, just an illusion, you may choose to experience this moment again. So is that 20,000 billion years from now? No, it already exists. You're having it now. So the structure of creation already exists all the time, right here, right now. How you wish to subjectively relate to that and how you want to generate a sense of time is up to you. And where you'll lend 20 years from now in your subjective experience will be a structure of creation that already exists. But 20 years from now, in your timeline experience, you'll choose to be aware of that particular frame. And so you'll call it 20 years from now. Does that make sense? Yes. Awesome. OK, one, one second. Um, <laughs> who is writing the script of the whole thing? In other words, as consci consciousness is expressing itself. Consciousness is expressing, expressing itself. itself, right? Yes through us as a, as a physical being. Yes. Who is writing the script of the consciousness, knowing that the consciousness is part of a whole that is complete? I'm trying to find a paradox that the whole is complete. Why should the whole differentiate itself to find itself? The, whole, it is, the whole is never complete. That's why it creates experience. If it was complete, we would not have experience. But that's the problem with that. There, so there's no place out there on you know, it's not linear from a systemic point of view, mm -hmm. where the whole is complete. It, it's not, the whole is never complete. So it, is, it is infinite, but it's never complete, precisely because it is infinite. So then, okay, so it's not complete. It comes down to, there's a script that I'm 60 years old that I have followed over the past 60 years. Well, a script, the term script, is only, it only makes sense from our limited, victimized point of view. Oh, there is a script because things are happening. From the point of view of the script writer, there is no script. There's just the writing in that moment. But is consciousness moving in all sorts of directions in a random process, or does it have a, a purpose? It has a, 
And what is it? Ah. <laughs> That's an interesting discussion. I find One second. That. Yes. <laughs> um, consciousness is motionless because it has no dimensions. Okay. Consciousness is motionless because it has no dimension. It has no space-time. Hmm. Sp space and time is a generated experience that consciousness generates. It is that which is aware of space-time. It is not within space-time. So it does not move around in that sense. But I get your question, which is, does it change its experience with a purpose? Absolutely. The purpose is to express infinity in form, in experienceable form. Because before consciousness is here, before awareness was generated by the infinite one, unity, which is complete in the sense that it's infinite, but not complete in the sense that it does not know itself. Okay. That's why it generates free awareness, free agency. This awareness then endowed with infinite intelligence in a workable form can start to generate an infinite universe that all exists now because there is no time. And then it can continue to multiply itself into different free agents that we call the I am. Infinite individuations of itself because its sole job description from the one is express me. How do you express infinity with something as finite as experience? You need as many experiences as you can to approach the idea of infinity in form. Does that make sense so far? It's fine. Is okay, the, wait. Is, is the driving force a driving force of love? Sorry? Is the driving force of this process love? You never mentioned the term love in your presentation, is, is love the driving force, the juice that keeps this system going? Is in, it, is in a way. The, is the infinite out of love? Mm, in, a way. in a way. In a way. Okay. I mean, you could call the need or the desire to know itself, you could call that love. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, how to attract an amazing life. Instant versus gradual manifestation. So, first of all, since you know there is only consciousness and you are it, damn, you're it, you're consciousness, you also realize that all experiences are generated through you and inside of you and by you. Does that make sense? You're like you're always projecting a movie inside of your own sphere of your I am consciousness. And you're always seeing your own movie projected onto your own screen, even if it seems to include mountains 200 miles from here, that is still projected inside of your I am here and now consciousness. Just like in your dream at night, mountains exist inside of your mind, correct? Inside of consciousness. Same here. The wall behind me, even though it seems to be 20 feet away from you, exists inside of your awareness of it as an experience only. It doesn't actually exist except as an experience inside of your consciousness. So you're always projecting a movie onto the inside of the sphere of your I am consciousness. Oh, mountains, stars, but it's all I am here. You're all experiencing your I amness in a particular form, in a particular configuration. So, since you know that consciousness will always be here now, and it's not moving in that sense, it also helps you to realize when it comes to actually mastering your vibratory state of being and with that attracting an amazing life in the realm of the movie. To generate a movie that is amazing to you, that reflects to you more of who you truly are, that you can extract benefit from even, even more, even quicker, and give benefit to even quicker, more and more rapidly, accelerating your theme's culmination, your, your theme's expression. You know, consciousness is always here, so you're not actually moving from here to there. You're not actually getting anywhere. You're always the center of your vortex. You're always the center of your creation. You are through which experiences are manifested, or seemingly made manifest, or made visible more accurately, because they already exist. Every potential configuration, every com potential movie picture already exists. But the sequence in which you make this visible to yourself 
depends on your vibratory state, depends on what you're sending out, depends on what you want to learn, depends on what's relevant for you, depends on your beliefs, depends on your expectations. You as the observer generate your conscious, sorry, generate your dream, generate your movie, whether that's consciously or not. So one of the most important things to remember when it comes to attracting a life that is amazing to you is that you are the attraction. It's not out there. It's not over here. You are the point of attracting. You are the magnet that attracts different slides of creation. So you can always stay right here. You can always be yourself. You can always be grounded in the here and the now of who you are. In a state of appreciation, in a state of joy, in a state of joyful anticipation, yet without anxiety, without lack beliefs, in other words, so with no lack beliefs, ideally, with no lack beliefs, you know that all exists inside of you here now consciousness. And all you need to do to attract an amazing life is activate a different string in your vibration, a different wavelength in what you emanate, in what you send out, in who you assume yourself to be, in who you define yourself to be in this moment. So you can stay right here and not think that you have to get something over there. Whenever you want something, whenever something appeals to you, whenever something seems to resonate with who you really are, when something out there seems to be a reflection of what you truly desire, who you truly are, instead of projecting it to be over there, understand that it's a symbol reminding you that everything is inside of here, and simply activate the frequency that gets triggered when you think of the thing, o thing over there. But let go of the idea that it's actually over there. Let it fill up your vibratory state over here. Does that make sense? Very important difference. Otherwise, you generate the sense of separation, the sense of causality, the sense of it's not yet here. It's inevitable to generate the sense of it's not yet here if you project that what you want is over there. The mind is very logical, so automatically it will generate the sense of I'm not there yet, I'm not complete yet, I'm not happy yet, I don't have what I want yet. My life is not amazing yet. And when you feel that way, that's what you're attracting. I'm not amazing. I'm not there. I don't have what I want. Even though you think, you know, if you watch The Secret, and that's really all you know about life in an apart way, and you start thinking all these beautiful things that you want for yourself that feel like they're extensions of who you are as a soul, or just things that you think you want because you think you're not complete yet, whatever it is, you can visualize that all you want, but if it always comes with the sense of it's over there, you will always generate the sense of it's not yet here. And not yet here is a feeling that activates a certain vibratory state that then sends out, it's not here. What do you see back? It's not here, even though you keep thinking of the thing you want. Does that make sense? So know that it's always going to be here. Let creation cycle through you. Don't go out of your way ever. The very fact that you're used to getting, going out of your way to get something is already coming from that sense of lack and insecurity. A confident person, some, if you see someone, even just on a material plane, if you see someone that seems to be really successful and really confident, even though on some level it might be a facade, sometimes it may be real, but what you'll always see is that there is a certain type of confidence there, a certain type of arrogance maybe even, depending on what it's filtered through in their particular makeup. However, what it all has in common is they don't feel like they have to get out of their way to get what they desire. It's a certain type of arrogance of everything comes to me. I've got people cleaning my things, I gotta just go get this for me, whatever it is, even if it's super arrogant. But there is a similarity there to someone being really empowered, which is the understanding everything cycles through me. Everything comes to me. I don't go anywhere. I'm lazy. I'm powerful, I'm free, I'm expansive. And in our case, that would be, I contain every possible reality I desire. All that I need to do in order to activate it is to feel that it's already here. When you feel that what you desire is already here and you eliminate all sense of there being a distance, A, you get instant gratification because you feel as if there's no difference between having it or not having it. And B, it will actually show up in some fashion. Does that make sense? 
So be arrogant in that way. It doesn't mean you lose kindness or compassion or love or integrity. It simply means you're arrogant enough to know that you are the center of this universe, that you are God. It's a certain type of arrogance, but it's also the truth. The one is very arrogant, but it cannot be negatively arrogant because it all knows that it's only the only thing there is. Since there is only the only thing there is, arrogance is not really an option in its mind. But from our point of view, the one is very arrogant because it contains everything that there is. So be like that. Be confident. Be free. Be powerful. Feel powerful. Feel like everything cycles through you, comes to you. Don't go out of your way. If you're going out of your way, you're already defining there to be some kind of lack. And when you define there to be some kind of lack, you will activate that in the vibratory state of your being. And then the mirror that you project, the movie that you project onto the inside of the sphere of your I am consciousness, this seemingly three or four dimensional world, will start to generate images that reflect how you feel, what you believe, what you put out. So be mindful of what you put out and let it always be a state of fulfillment of some kind. If you notice that there's something that you desire that is not here right now physically, notice that. Think of the thing or imagine or embody the energy of the thing that you desire and what it triggers in you. Why do you want it? What does it symbolize? A certain state of being, a certain feeling, feeling good, feeling amazing. Let it trigger that feeling of amazement and let go of all sense of here versus there, now versus then, separation, lack, isolation, and just feel what it feels like to be that complete. And when you do that, A, you'll have instant gratification, and B, the thing that wants to come to you can actually show up to you because you're not keeping it away by feeling like it's not here. If you keep saying it's not here yet, it's not, I want that so much. I want that relationship. I want that car. I want that house. I want that career. I want that job change. I want that state of being. I want that state of self-realization, whatever it is. But I want it, I want that one that's over there. It can't come to you. Because what you're sending out is, it's over there. And it goes, okay, I'll keep making it appear over there. Over there. Over there, are you sure? Yes, it's over there. Okay. That's why you have to be careful not to be too reflective of what is, but be more creative of what you want. Be more in the creative space. The mind is not reflective, it is creative in nature. Whatever you think is in the process of becoming something, becoming an experience, a more fully embodied experience. So don't just randomly think and reflect upon what is, as if that's real, because you'll only continue to reassert what is, and then your next parallel reality shift, which is a 100% completely different universe, no structural relationship to your previous one whatsoever, 100% different, will have to look similar to your previous creation because you keep sending out what you already know. So you have to, in a sense, become a little bit delusional, just a little bit, where you let go of what is. You stop reasserting what is. So that change can actually happen because change happens through you, to you, towards you. It shows up for you. So if you want what you see to change, you need to change your vibratory state. If you keep paying too much attention to what actually is, your vibratory state will continue to reflect your previous vibratory state, which has been made manifest through your circumstances, which you now reflect because you think it's real. And then what you send out to your future image is the same thing. And so the same thing will show up. So if you wish to accelerate the manifestation or the attraction of an amazing life. You need to be in a state of changelessness, uh, sorry, changeability. You have to be able to wander within your own state of being. You have to be able to not tie how you feel to what shows up. It's very difficult for many people, very challenging. Yes. If you wish to accelerate the attraction of an amazing life within your movie, within your creation, which is all up to you, you deserve everything you desire because it's your creation, it's your theme, it's up to you. You have to be willing and able and conscious enough to not tie how you feel about yourself and about life to what is. What is should no longer dictate 
how you feel. What appears now should no longer be an indication of who you are. If you can detach your state of being from your circumstances, then your circumstances will continue to reflect you, and before you know it, you start to understand that. You're not separate from your experience, you're not separate from your circumstances, but all they do is reflect you, never the other way around. They move through you, never the other way around. You never move through your circumstances. They reflect your state of being, you learn from it, you decide what you'd rather want to experience next. You activate that in your frequency field, not believing that it has to be dependent upon how things show up. And then things will actually show up in a way that's in alignment with how you chose to feel regardless of your previous circumstances. Does that make sense? Awesome. Can you all do that? Do you feel you can do that? Or do you take your circumstances too seriously? Yes. <laughs> nice. Can you do that? Yes. Do you take it too seriously? Yes. Many people do. That's what we teach each other. We teach each other to pay attention to what is all the time. This is real. Pay attention to what is. Don't be too happy. Because nothing in your circumstances indicate that you should be. So why are you smiling when your mom is dying? Why wouldn't you? <gasps> oh. Can I be happy when my mom's dying? <laughs> yes, of course you can. Can I be happy when my empire disappears? Yes, of course you can. Are you able to declutch, detach your state of being from your circumstances? You said yes, but are you? <laughs> Thank you. So can you stop taking your cue from your circumstances? It's very challenging and it's very subtle. It's a very subtle, endless learning curve. And I include myself in that learning curve. There's endless degrees of being able to no longer look at your circumstances at all. then you're in the state of the non-physical. Then you're in a higher vibratory state, which is much closer to the actual state of your higher self. What happens? You'll see that much more. You'll have access to that much more love, that much more wisdom, that much more connection, that much more freedom, that much more empowerment. All because you have learned to positively ignore your circumstances without ignoring your integrity. There's a difference. Ignoring circumstances does not mean to ignore your sanity or your integrity. It simply means to not take your cue from what is as to how you should feel and choose your next reality. Does that make sense, the difference? You can be in complete integrity and complete compassion towards all of your creation without taking any cue from them or that which is as to how you should induce your state of being with a feeling next. You can choose whatever feeling you wish to induce yourself with next. It's not dependent on what appears. It's not. Your movement in that sense, your energetic movement is completely unaffected by your circumstances. Circumstances do not transmit a state of being. They can't. This table does not give me a feeling. I give me a feeling based on my ideas about this table. Now, if you start slapping me in the face, Jim, that does not transmit a feeling into me. I will experience, I'm not saying that I won't feel anything physically, the nervous system won't flare up and that consciousness won't register that sensation, but what I'm saying is that how I feel about that and how I let that affect what I choose next in terms of how I feel about myself and life in general, what I believe, what my conviction is for the next moment, is not transmitted to me by your hand, your molecules slapping my molecules. In fact, your molecules are my molecules, and these are yours, so it doesn't even matter anyway, not really. So you're slapping me in the face, and because I have a definition about that being really pleasurable, my state of being, yeah, <laughs> this is also not based on a real story, <laughs> Just a hypothetical example. <laughs> my state of being will feel amazing. I will infuse my state of being with, oh my God, this, feels, this is amazing. This is great. <laughs> and so the, <laughs> the next reflection will be that he slaps me even harder because that's what I happen to like. Now, if I did not like that, 
if I did not like him slapping me around, but I still define that in a positive way, what will happen next is that he stops slapping me in the face because that's what I actually want. So if you want to receive what you actually desire, you have to define what is in the most positive way possible. Why? Because if you define something to be positive, to be in your best interest, your frequency will align itself with the vibratory state you wish to experience in the next moment. Since you've chosen to already experience it now, regardless of what happened, your reality can actually reflect that. And so you're attracting to you very rapidly an amazing life. Would it be helpful to have an instant shift from where you're at to the ultimate dream that you desire of? Would it be beneficial to have that experience instantaneously? Would it be interesting for you to have exactly everything you want right now? Would it be? Would it not be? Cool. Maybe it's different for everyone. For me, it's not that interesting. Because it feels so unreal. It's not interesting. The part that's so interesting about being physically focused is that there seems to be progress that there seems to be some gradual nature, some linear transition from where I am to where I want to be. And it is through that gradual learning curve, rapid as it may be, I'm not saying not to accelerate. I'm saying if you would skip 20 years and end up in who you can be 20 years from now, you would have no knowledge of anything that happened in between. Now how valuable would that be? How interesting would that universe look to you if you have no context to understand why you're what you're looking at. How would, would that really give you a greater sense of evolution, a greater sense of expansion? Would that really add to the sense of having overcome, of having empowered, of having transformed? It would just be like a dream. And we already have that on a non-physical level. That's why it's not that interesting. That's why this is interesting. That's why limitation is interesting. That's why the gradual illusion of the linear physical reality is an interesting focus to spend some time with recreating. Because now you can make sense out of things. You can, in a sense, paste a story onto it. And I don't mean that in the drama-driven victim story sense. I mean story in a more holistic way. You, as consciousness, are now adding story to creation. You're adding relationship to creation. You're adding novels to creation. And that's how it expands itself. That's how it expands upon itself, is through storytelling. And again, I mean it in a very holistic, energetic way, storytelling, adding novels, to cre adding stories, adding lifetimes to creation. That is how it expands upon its relationship to the structure that already exists in a timeless stasis state. The universe cannot expand upon what is possibly configurable, because that already exists. It expands itself through how it relates to that and in what order it goes from this one to that one to that one, and if it even wants to go from this one to that one to that one, maybe this particular I am consciousness wants to go from this one to this one to that one, creating a completely new story out of the infinite possibilities that are already timelessly created and don't expand. Does that make sense? The value of being physically focused is that you tell a story to creation that it has never told itself before. That is how you are valuable. That's how your expansion occurs. So there is that balance between gradual and instant manifestation. You always instantly manifest the next frame, but from the story subjective logical point of view, you're going to make that seemingly gradual. I'm not saying you're not going to accelerate this. You're going to accelerate this to a great extent, to where you feel less and less and less limited and more and more like it is a dream. But what is so unique and beautiful about this particular timing is that you learn how to gradually increase the acceleration of your changing from one parallel reality to another in a very conscious fashion. Bottom line, feel amazing about where you're at. Because it's about to disappear and change into something else. This is interesting. I'm not saying take your cue from what appears and what your parents have told you the way that things appear right now should mean to you and how you should feel about that. Completely always empower yourself to feel about what you see in a completely new way. It's up to you. Is your mother dying? 
absolutely awesome. Have a party. Be happy. Or not. Up to you. Just because your parents told you that that's a really sad event, and just because everyone's wearing black. I love black, by the way. Doesn't mean that you cannot show up being happy. Of course, there's this thing called respect and integrity. You know, you can honor that a little bit. A little bit. You cannot too rapidly expand other people's worlds, but inside you can be happy. And to an extent, to the outside, you can start to, with wisdom, overflow that peaceful confidence that everything is all right into those around you at that funeral. And maybe even wear a party hat, depending on what your family is like and whether they tend to bring their shotguns to funerals. <laughs> But it is entirely up to you how you feel, how you perceive. Any given circumstantial moment, there is nothing set in stone. Nothing inherently transmits a state of being into you. It's all subjectively self-generated, self-defined. And there is nothing in creation that suggests that one particular experience should be experienced in a certain way. Nothing in creation that suggests, except for our law book, and you know. Human brains and the collective consciousness and all the morals that we've agreed on and the traditions and the lineages and all that bullshit. Aside from that nonsense that is man-made, there is nothing inherent in the structure of creation that suggests that a particular configuration of molecules should mean you feel bad. Whatsoever, there is not a single configuration of molecules that inherently structurally suggests that you should feel a certain way about it. In other words. All the timeless, infinite creations of this universe are neutral and without meaning. You are there to tell the tale. You are there to generate the story, and how free you are in being able to generate that story for yourself according to your own highest intuition and desires will determine what configuration of the universe will fall into your slide next to show you the reflection of your chosen state of being. And in this way, you can very consciously and with no ego, just because you are a desirous being, just because you are an aligned being, just because you are a passionate expression of creation, wanting to tell as many tales as you can in as beautiful and epic a way as you can, because that is what expands upon the universe. Nothing else will. Only you can expand upon this universe. Nothing else will. So it is your duty, your job, your honor, your desire to be of service to the Creator. By telling an epic tale, I'm not saying everyone should become an action hero or a spiritual teacher or a famous rock star. Epic can look like anything. The most epic reality is if it's in alignment with who you feel you truly are, free from blockages and negative definitions picked up along the way. Realizing that you can clear out all these negative definitions, and this is what empowerment and acceleration is. And apply and paste your own new definitions, subjective perspectives onto every single inherently neutral and meaningless configuration of molecules. I'd love to see someone quote me on that sentence. Circumstances do not create your state of being; it's the other way around. This is the bottom line of the empowerment teaching. When you get that. <gasps> You become more and more non-physically connected and in tune with yourself. You come from a non-physical focus, and yes, you notice the physical focus, but it's just the tail end of your expression of who you are. It's no longer the dominating factor indicating and giving cues to how you should feel, what you should do, who you should respond to. You are now God. You are now Creator, Co-Creator. You are now as you are created to be, in the image of the Creator. The image of the creator is not the created. The image of the creator is another creator, because that's its exact image. The created is its opposite. If you are created in the image of your creator, that does not mean you're the opposite. It means you're created in the image of your creator, which means your creator. Right? So you are a creator. You can't help creating. You can only make it so unconscious 
that it seems like everything is happening for you. And then you get these really, really boring spiritual teacher, teachings sorry, that talk about there is no free will. Everything just happens. Yes, but who do you think is doing it? You're the receiver of your experiences only because you are also the giver of your experiences. So that grace that you surrender to, from its own point of view, is your higher you. And the more you separate yourself from that which is creating your experiences, the more you feel victimized and separate and like there is no free will, which is the antichrist, is the anti-thought. It does not exist. No free will does not exist. Everything contains free will. The more you give that story of, I'm separate from my creator. Even if you call it innocence, even if you call it egolessness, it is still a fallacy. It's still an ignorant perspective of creation. It's still not true you're still separating your vibratory state from that of your higher true self, which is creating everything you see right here, right now. If you want to get closer to that true love, that true wisdom, that true connection, that true humility, that true selflessness, you need to become more as the creator is. You cannot become more like in vibration by separating yourself from that which creates all that is. You have to become more like it. Always honor your integrity. Always honor the integrity of other people's free will, other beings' free will. Of course, live with as much compassion and kindness and love and generosity as you can. Those are not mutually exclusive. In fact, this becomes more natural as you learn that there is no lack of your creative abilities. And so you feel overflowing with empowerment and confidence because you know that you're in control of your reality all the time, on some level. The more you download this knowing, the more you liken your frequency onto the frequency of the Creator, of your higher self. And the more you'll be endowed with the selflessness that are natural qualities of that higher state of consciousness. You can't be selfless by pretending to be, by trying to be. Selflessness is a natural expression of you getting closer in your frequency to who you truly are. Who are you? Are you the victim? Is God the victim? Is your higher self the victim? No. So stop playing victim unless you want to be selfless, selfish and insistent and arrogant, even in your humility. Oh, I know nothing. I have no power to create. Your will is my will. Well, that is true <laughs> because it's you. But you have to become, at your own pace, at your own comfort level, more and more and more as the Creator is. And you have to not be afraid of embracing your power. And you have to know that you're a good person, that you are an abundant being that does not perceive lack and therefore does not need to steal happiness from others in order to be happy him or herself. This is where the false humility story comes into play. It's like, well, if I am powerful, then other people must lack power. If I am happy, then other people must be lacking happiness. If I'm happy, I can only be happy by stealing it from you because there's only so much water on this planet, because there's only so much money in the banks, because there's only so much happiness around. Man made thoughts, not God made thoughts. How does God see life? How does the Creator see life? How does your higher self perceive this moment? As one of many infinite possible realities, all coexisting right here, right now, with no lack for anyone in any aspect of life. That is how it sees creation. If you want to become more like it, you have to see more as it sees. How do you do that? Clear out any perspective that makes you feel bad. That's where the guidance system of the emotional body comes in. It is your higher self letting you know the fastest way to merge with it, to become more like it in form, in expression. Whenever you feel bad, it is letting you know 
that you're placing your vibration further away from the truth of creation. Whenever you feel good, it's letting you know that the way you see life is rooted in a vibrational state of position that is closer in alignment to the way that the Creator sees itself. That's what feels amazing. So in order to attract an amazing life, pay attention to when you feel bad. Transform the negative perceptions that distort you further away from the One and replace it with a perspective that is holistic, beautiful, compassionate, and abundant and infinite in nature. And you'll feel instantly better. Why? Because the emotional body is not a random mechanism, although we've polluted it quite a bit. Make it seem random. But it is a very clear guidance system, even now in our polluted state, of higher self communicating to lower self, whether or not our perspective is right or wrong. Very simple. Yes, there is right and wrong in that sense. Not value-wise. Everyone is right. Everyone has validity, equal validity. But in terms of your perspective being correct or incorrect, that's absolutely there. And incorrect perspectives still add to the expansion of creation. So it's still allowed. It's still valid. It's still loved. However, from a very individual relative point of view, the quickest way to become more as your higher self already is, is to notice when you feel bad and change your perspective to one that feels amazing, which is literally your higher self entering your being, letting you know, thank you for widening your channel to receive more of me. <sighs> this is what feels good. When it feels bad, it means you're contracting yourself. You're pinching, you're squeezing the flow, the amount of flow of higher self that is possible for you. So something is hap up, something is happening, something is incorrect in the way you see life. In order to accelerate your expansion, which will always be gra gradual as long as you're physically focused, but that's beautiful, that's valuable, is to expand, to open up, to receive more joy, to know you're worthy of joy, first of all. Because to think you're not worthy of joy is already an out-of-alignment perspective. As long as you believe you're unworthy of feeling good, you're not going to allow yourself to feel good. So check in before you even try this empowerment thing. See if you believe you're worthy of feeling good. Or whether that's a bad thing, a sinful thing, an egotistical thing. My teacher told me I should not feel good. It's bad to feel good. It's not in acceptance. It's not in flow. I should feel bad and be really happy about that. I should feel bad and accept it as it is and not move. Just don't move. Don't think. Okay, sorry. Or are you allowed to be happy? Which is the way the universe communicates with itself. You have to understand that beyond the human level, there is only infinite bliss. There is no justification. There is no cause and effect. If you want to become more expanded, more selfless, more true in your view of life, you have to let go of the human view of life, which is rooted in lack and unworthiness. It's not true. It's valid. It's an expression of the infinite. But it's not true. It's not correct. It doesn't feel good because it's not correct. Whatever is true feels good. Like truly, holistically, peacefully good. And excitingly good. Not just like, oh yeah, this feels good, but underneath, no, I know I did something that, well, I stole this happiness from someone else, and now I think I feel good for a moment, but no, not really. That's not the type of happiness I speak of. The happiness, the feeling good I speak of is a holistic overflowing of goodness. <gasps> feeling amazing about yourself no matter what. That is what creation is like all the time. Aside from inside the human mind bubbles. Even the human mind spiritual bubbles. If you truly wish to develop a true view, you have to let go of the human view, including rel the religious and the spiritual and the self-realization human view. You've got to really be selfless enough to get past all your barriers of sin and unworthiness and being afraid of your arrogance, which is the most arrogant thing you could do. Just be afraid of becoming arrogant. How arrogant of you to think that when you expand, you will become more egotistical. How is that possible? The ego is the substitute servant that takes care of us when we don't. What's the worst way to take care of yourself? By feeling bad all the time and reinforcing that, believing that that's how you should feel. Then, of course, the ego effect kicks in because it wants to take care of you, make sure you're all right. 
make sure you're safe. Paradoxically, the ego effect free state does not appear humble per se. It appears bright and luminous and shiny and generous and free and epic and awesome and radiant and powerful and it stands out but only because no one else does. Not because it is arrogant. It stands out because everyone else insists upon something that's not true and they're closing down their channel. Then someone that opens up will stand out. Will see more shiny, will see more arrogant. Only because you don't. Listen to the arrogant people in this world. Learn from them. Not in a negative way. Learn from them in a harmonious way. Learn from the confident people. Learn from the shiny people. Whether in the field of spirituality or not, I don't care. Can be a business owner that's highly successful. And yes, that may have a lot of misperceptions regarding the nature of reality. But learn from their state somehow and apply it to your own harmonious, integral knowing of the goodness that you are. Start shining yourself. Start radiating. Start feeling more expanded beyond your chest, beyond your body. The more you're feeling close by the body, the more that is a sign that you're seeing things in an incorrect way. Yes, there is incorrect ways of seeing things. And there is more correct ways of seeing things, more accurate, more relevant, more precise, more harmonious, more in line with all that is, being one inseparable being of infinite abundance. So shine, especially when no one else does. Step on their toes if they insist to put their toes right in front of your feet. Because that's what happens. Because when you start shining, you attract both more of the shininess as well as the opposite, making its unconsciousness more conscious to itself. How will it do that? It will attract certain shiny, standout examples and it will bash them or embrace them. Learn from them consciously. Thank you. Or learn from them unconsciously. <laughs> but learn from what they attract, they will. So let everyone learn from you, because that's part of your service. In whatever way they choose to learn, positively or negatively. Accepting or rejecting. In resistance or in flow. Do not be afraid to shine. Or do. Whatever feels best. Whatever feels more precise, accurate, and correct for you. But if we could all light up a little bit more, then no one else would have to stand out as much. Because we all would. And then no one does. A hundred years from now, there won't be spiritual teachers anymore, as we know it. Hopefully. <laughs> Be redundant. Be absolutely redundant. Spirituality will cease to exist. Because it's a man-made concept. It does not exist. We're just talking about life. We're just talking about creation. Spirituality is an antidote to having constricted our flow. Oh, are you a spiritual person by any chance? I've just discovered that I don't feel good all the time. And I want to explore what it's like to expand myself. Are you a spiritual person? Can I relate to you? That won't exist anymore. No, I'm not a spiritual person. That's just woo-woo. They're right. It is woo-woo. Spirituality does not exist. It is a man-made concept. It is for those that wish to escape. But also the view that there is no spirit, that there is no consciousness, that there is nothing more, is also incorrect. But spirituality is an antidote, temporarily necessary, to take us out of the compressed state, the contracted state, into the expanded state. Once you're in the expanded state, you see the inseparability of life and the brilliance of all that is. And then where is spirituality? Where is the spiritual person versus the non-spiritual being? Where is the one who is conscious versus the one that's somehow not conscious? It will cease to exist, hopefully. It will eventually. 
So when we all stand out, when we all shine, then no one stands up. And all will be brilliant in their own way, in their own right, and accepted and learned from, and everything will accelerate. Do not be afraid to shine. It is what this world needs. It's the best way to be a whistleblower on the ignorance of humanity. It's to shine. It doesn't mean you have to speak out, necessarily, as I do. You can keep quiet if you want to. But by radiating, you will say so much more than you ever can from a contracted state of being. Be happy no matter what. Show people that they have the option to redefine the neutral appearance of the configuration of molecules. That's all it is. Configuration of molecules, which is energy, which is consciousness. We can choose how we wish to respond to something all the time. What we wish to create, what we wish to generate, how we wish to feel, how we wish to perceive this moment. Show people they have this choice by being an embodiment of it. And don't long for instant manifestation of your amazing life because it keeps your pace slow. Why? Because you keep seeing it as not yet here. And it will have to respond to it not yet being here. I want instant manifestation. I want that thing now. In other words, I don't have it now. And life goes, oh, you don't have it now? Okay, you don't have it now. Whereas if you let go of that and start appreciating the curve that you're in, the upwards accelerating, gradual, graduating curve that you're in, of accelerating the pace of your gradual manifestation so that the story makes sense to you and you can actually enjoy every stage of it. And the more conscious you are of yourself, the more in alignment you are with yourself, the quicker you learn from every single second, the more you extract from every single second. The more unconscious you are, the more it takes years to learn what a conscious person learns in a single second. So the more you become conscious, then yes, the more your manifestation abilities, seemingly, although they're already at their perfect maximum capacity, will start to reflect that ability to accelerate, to instantly manifest things more and more quickly and frequently. But only because the one who more quickly manifests, not because they skip things, but because they learn quicker from what is because they're more conscious of what is. Not what is in the circumstantial sense, like, oh, this is, so I must feel this way. What is meaning, this shows up right now, it's a reflection of who I am. What do I want next? I want this next. Oh, this is a reflection of who I was. What does it teach me? Oh, mm, this does not feel, feel quite the way I thought it would feel. This, however, is amazing. Whoop, oh, mm, full amazingness, here right now. Whoop, and then it reflects itself again. Oh, what does this reflect in me? Awesome. So the more consciously you learn, the more quickly within a similar seemingly lifespan reality you manifest. But not because you're skipping steps, but because you're learning more efficiently. You need less time to bring something to your attention. Does that make sense? You can't skip ahead of your own theme. You wouldn't want to skip ahead of your own theme. Only the mind, rooted in the idea something is lacking now, thinks it desires that. But your true being desires to tell every single step of this story. How fun would it be to read a book and then to go from one page to the other and suddenly you notice you're missing a couple of scenes. It's like, wait, what? I have no context to understand this. This is not interesting anymore. Same is the case from the higher self point of view and from the personal consciousness point of view. You want to know what happens every step of your way, of your theme, no? Learn faster. Be more attentive. Be more excited about what appears and what it shows you and how you wish to recreate what is and how you wish to recreate what is and how you wish to recreate what is and how you wish to feel regardless of what is and how you wish to feel regardless of what is and how you wish to feel regardless of what is. So that what it takes someone else to take 10 years to learn and express and manifest takes you two days. That is acceleration. 
It's not skipping ahead of yourself. It is learning more efficiently. A little side note to that, a little disclaimer. <laughs> to the one that is in the accelerated stage, two days will feel like two years. What a perfect way to practice patience by learning not to wait. Because if you're not waiting, you don't need patience. How can you not wait? By being in full joy regardless of what is. So what I'm saying is, yes, you'll accelerate. What takes someone else to pay attention to in two-year time span because they're just so unconscious and not willing in that moment to face themselves, to make contact with their direct experience, their own creation. Those two days to you will feel like two years. So you'll still have the same sense of, when is this coming? When is this happening? It's been two hours. My new house hasn't arrived yet. What the F? Whereas someone else that learns at a pace of two years what you do in two days, they go like, man, you're moving fast. I didn't know this was possible. And you're like, what, fast? Well, I guess I can see that from your point of view. Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. Now I appreciate my flow that much more. And voila, the house comes. Because you were in appreciation of your flow, you changed your state of being. So always be in appreciation as much as you can. Be in confidence as much as you can. Take everything as a sign that things are working out, that you are being amazing, that you are learning. Always enjoy your present learning curve by knowing that it's awesome. And then what will always be gradual will accelerate. And by the end of a single lifetime, you will have written such an epic story for yourself that even though 20 years ago you thought you turned it into a book, by then, you would know where to start. But you'll know that the book has been written, that the story has been told, that all the evidence exists and is stored, and that many beings alongside you have learned from your story. In fact, all of creation has learned from your story. So the book has been written. Be the example. Be the expansion. Be the accelerated learning. Be your own point of attraction. Be your own creator. And everything else will benefit too. For after all, there's only one. Any questions? Do we have the microphone somewhere? Oh, thanks, Pete. So with the... Um, oh, sure. With the assertion of my will to be happy... With the what? With the assertion of my will to stay happy and be happy... Yes. Regardless of what is. Yes. Thank you. Will there not be a shitstorm? There might be. Of the unconscious unfurling and testing my conviction of that happiness. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. So it's been my <laughs> experience. <laughs> Just getting ready. That's all. <laughs> Does that excite you? No. Not yet. It does not excite you. Well, that's a perfect way for the unconscious to show up. That's why it's a shitstorm is required. At some point, shitstorms are no longer required in the way that they used to be. I'm not saying no challenging intersections where everything comes together at a culminating fashion won't appear to you. They will continue to appear. You continue to have beginnings of your chapters and endings of your chapters. Beginnings and endings, learnings and integration and expansion, etc. These waves of creation, of expansion and integration, expansion and integration, expansion and integration, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, they will always continue to occur, especially with the physical focus being so apparent to your consciousness right now, being here, in other words. However, what most people call a shitstorm, which is 
where everything has to go wrong, where everything you have built has to disappear or just taken away from you with no sign of anything else reappearing that's better, where everything just seems to continuously negatively create itself. That's the perfect way for your unconscious to show itself to your consciousness. Because what is it showing you? It's showing you that your definitions are negative to begin with. You have a set of negative definitions, a set of, I'm unworthy of total bliss, I'm not capable of total bliss, this is just not the way the universe works, there is limitation, there is isolation. For everything good that happens to me, two bad things need to happen to me. No pain, no gain. All these beliefs are start to show up for you, which is a good sign. It means you're transcending them. If you were not transcending them, they would not show up to you because you would not have any context to understand them, and your higher self is not a cruel being. It does not feed you lessons you don't have the capacity to consciously take on. So if a shitstorm arises, it's a great compliment to your already present learning curve transcendence. Does that make sense? The shitter you're the storm, the more capable you have become. Does that make sense? So first of all, it's a compliment. And when you define the next coming, <laughs> the next upcoming shitstorm in that way, and you start seeing it as a beautiful cyclone instead of a shitstorm, and you see it as a bliss storm, then you are already at least halfway, if not 80 to 90 percent, there to extracting all the benefit that that bliss storm or cyclone is there to show you to begin with. The thing it wants to show you most is that you have control over how you define your circumstances. Now, if at the first inkling of the shitstorm arising, you start to immediately program yourself to define it in the most blissful way, you've already learned almost all lessons that it has to show you. And it will not be a shitstorm. It will actually turn out to be a bliss storm. What starts out as a shitstorm can be immediately turned around to become a bliss storm, depending on how you realize your freedom to what extent you realize you're free to define that moment. Yes, shitstorm appears in your old definitions, but in your new definitions, that's no longer a shitstorm. It's now amazingly appreciated and a sign of your ascendance. And so you're absolutely stoked at the sight of your shitstorm, which is now your bliss cyclone, and it will spin you into orbit. Whee! <laughs> so use your shitstorms wisely so that they, in that fashion, will never have to show up because they won't be relevant for you to see anymore. They have been integrated. All benefit has been extracted and learned, which is, this is not a shitstorm. This is your own self talking to you, which is benign and blissful once you get that. And then it can start to communicate to you in, shall we say, lighter ways, more enjoyable ways, less destructive, less chaotic, less random, less unconscious ways. It can start to simply communicate to you. And now, at some point, you start to learn most of your lessons before they ever have to be made manifest. Most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. You start to learn on the level of imagination because you become snappier. You, because be you become more attentive because you start to see more how you communicate with yourself and that everything is an inseparable self-creation. So now at the first sight of a negative thought, you're already paying attention to what your vibration beyond that thought was. Why did I even have a negative thought? Oh, I must have had the conviction that there's a lack of money, or there's a lack of this, or there's a lack of... Ah, oh, awesome. Lack does not exist in the universal eye. So let me align myself with the universal eye, which is infinite abundance, infinite endless parallel realities. Anything can change in a second, in a nanosecond. Abundance enough for everyone. Ah, oh, thank you. Boom. Now you feel totally different about that same scenario. You've learned before it has had to made been manifest in terms of bankruptcy or anything like that, for example. Does that make sense? So you've paid attention to your vibratory state. Again and again, more and more, you will become a vibrational wanderer and not a situational wanderer. You start to master your vibration, not your situation. The quicker you learn, the more you keep it right here, right now, knowing that everything cycles through you, knowing that everything is up to you, knowing that everything is here to show you something and everything is here to ask you something too. It's here to show you what you previously gave to it asking to you. And it is here to now ask to you, what do you wish to give me next? Which I will show you in a minute. That's how creation works. 
What do you want to tell me next? I'll give it to you in a minute. Ah, you believe there's infinite abundance? Okay. One second. Ta-da! <laughs> How do you wish to respond to this? What is it reflecting? It's reflecting what you previously told me. What would you like? Now that you see the manifestation of what you previously told me, whether consciously or unconsciously, that's why many people are very successful because they have a few unconscious beliefs that are in alignment with the universe. <laughs> Lucky bastards. <laughs> what would you like to tell me next? What would you like for me to create for you next? And you go, oh, well, let's see. More infinite bliss. Okay, thank you. One second. Ta-da! And so on and on it goes. Now, if you do the common thing, which is the negative cycle, which is to respond to what is shown to you, hey, what do you think about this? This is what you told me yesterday or two minutes ago. What do you think about this? this is, I'm speaking as creation right now, but understand, I'm assuming. Creation is like, hello. Here you go. This is what you told me to get for you two seconds ago, two minutes ago, two hours ago, two days ago, two years ago, two lifetimes ago, whatever. What is this showing you? Are you making it more conscious? Are you integrating what you see as a reflection of your unconscious beliefs? Are you making it more conscious and transforming it and aligning it in alignment with the universal way of seeing things? And what would you like me to get for you next? If you respond to that in a common way, for example, um, a funeral should be sad, which there's no indication that it should be. Where is the indication that it should be? The dead body is not suggesting that it's sad. It's not talking anymore anyway. And the wood is not suggesting it. The grave is not suggesting it. The flames are not suggesting it. The coffee, cheap coffee, is not suggesting it. Well, maybe the chief coffee is just. But other than that, there's nothing inherent to that circumstance that suggests a funeral should be sad. You do. Your memory of your parents do. Your memory of your other people, your peers do. There's so much we bring to each creation asking us, hello, this is what you told me next time, a uh, last time. Learn from this, and now what would you like to see next? We so often unconsciously respond to that with beliefs that are, have never been our own. That's why they feel so heavy, it's because they're not ours. Anything you carry with you that's not yours feels heavy. So if you keep saying, well, yeah, it's showing you a funeral. What would you like to see next? Well, this is really sad. Okay, one second. Someone pushes over the body and it falls in the ground. It's like, <laughs> jaw dropping out. Well, how would you like to respond to this? And you go, well, this is terrible. Okay, one second. Your unknowing heavy uncle steps backwards and squashes the face. Oh my God. How would you like to respond to this? Oh my God, I can't handle this. Okay. And you faint. That's the negative downward spiral. It's an exaggerated version of what's actually occurring to us on a day-to-day -day basis. If you become more aware of this, you become more in control of this by mastering your frequency, not your situation, your frequency. Always respond to what shows up in the way you wishes to appear for it next, for it to appear next. If you want for that dead body to not be stepped on in the next moment when it already fell down, you have to be really excited about the fact that it fell down. Because then what you get is a really exciting reflection of that, which may be that it wasn't dead at all. Start standing up and talking again. Anything is possible. Jesus did it, right? Why not you? Be really excited. So anything, everything is a constant reflection of what you say that it is. It's always what you say it is. It always becomes what you say it is, 24-7. Do we have the microphone? Thanks. I understand what you're saying in a personal in a personal way, like things happen in your life and how you react to that. But then if you take a more global view of that, mm -hmm. is it the same? Like, mm -hmm. 
wars and these awful stories that we hear even in Longmont or whatever that have nothing to do with me personally. But it does because I don't hear them. Why do certain people hear about these stories all the time? It's because they're so tempted to turn on the television. I'm not saying this is you. I'm just saying in general. Why do they turn on the television? Because there's beliefs in them that are interested in the nastiness that's going on. Or they're not conscious and enjoying their own life enough to not turn on the television or to not watch the news or read the newspaper. It's a reflection of your own degree of excitement with your own life. If it's not very high, if you're not very connected, then any form of entertainment will do. In other words, whatever happens out there is extremely personal. And there is no difference, not really. In, and this works in a variety of ways. One, the most obvious one being that if negative news reaches you and, and is interpreted in a negative way and experienced as a bad thing, then what you'll show up next, what will show up next is more of the bad news. Because how do you respond to the bad news with this is really bad? Creation goes, okay, one second, let me create a new war over here. Send a shitty news reporter over there, connect it to your television. Hey, what do you think of that? What do you think of that war that I just started for you? Thank you so much for calling the previous one bad so I could reinforce that by starting yet another war. All the, uh, all the while, the person behind the television is being absolutely arrogant not understanding that they continue to feed the negativity by feeling so selfless that they complain about how bad the world is, judging those that don't see it as bad at all. Uh, again, not saying at all this is you. I'm just like taking this picture to the extreme and saying what I often see in people out there, especially those that don't come to my meetings, is that they feel so good about them. So this is how low their excitement in their life is, okay? That they feel the most exciting thing for them is to feel really, really good about themselves, complaining about how bad the world is and blaming happy people for being happy. If this is you, When we are excited, we're actually adding to a creation on a global scale that is excited. This is a law of the universe. If you're not happy, you're not helping. So check in. doesn't matter how many f kids you feed in Africa. doesn't matter if you fed 10,000 kids. If you were unhappy all the time doing it, you were a destructive force. You did not help one bit, except in the negative direction. If you fed 10,000 kids in Africa single-handedly, but you fed, felt bad and projected that they were suffering with every single moment, not seeing the goodness in life, you have not helped one bit. In fact, the second half of those 10,000 kids, the latter 5,000, have been your creation. They would not be starving if you were not unhappy with the first 5,000 kids you were feeding. This is how creation works. Take responsibility. If you want to be selfless, you need to shine. I know it's a paradox. Humanity does not agree. So what? They don't know what they're doing. Humanity has not a clue of how this works. You've got to be happy. If you're not happy, you're not helping. It's a law of the universe. If you're not happy, you're not hep helping. You're helping, but in a negative direction, which is fine. You can do that. It's still expanding upon the universe, but we've done that for millennia collectively as a global species. Now it's time to change our perspective so that what we see can actually change. But what we see can't change if we don't first change our perspective. So if you're rooted in there's so much misery out there, there's so much war out there, let me help out. It may seem like the most selfless thing to do, but it's more selfless to sit your ass down, turn off the television, and visualize what it feels like to already have an amazing planet right here, right now, being born inside of your chest. Now you're helping. Does that make sense? 
physical help is only goes so far. And I'm not saying not to physically help out and not to physically feed kids in Africa and not to physically whatever. That's all beautiful. But the extension of it, it has to be an extension of your joy and your benign perspective of the holistic value of life. And if you can bring that energy to the physical help, then it's a complete cycle and you'll actually be able to notice opportunities that will actually collectively on a very large scale make complete collective shift instead of continue to create the negative thing that you're feeding, literally and figuratively. So it does work on a global level, the same as it works on a personal level. It just requires more personal levels to do the same thing, to understand the same thing. But again, more personal levels will understand this, the more you as a personal level understand this and are an example of this. And then very rapidly, there's going to be this threshold, this tipping point, and in a way, in many ways, we've already crossed this tipping point. But, you know, every addition to the momentum in the upward spiraling energy is a very helpful one. And there's many thresholds that we're passing, passing, passing. As soon as there's a certain amount of beings that are part of a collective agreement that shift our understanding of the collective agreement, the collective agreement will have to reflect, will have to reflect this. If only one personal being in a very powerful way has very clearly eliminated all lack in their belief system, then they will start to live in a bubble reality that is, in a way, to an extent, detached from the collective agreements that the collective around them suffers from, is an unconscious victim of. And it will generate a universe where things work differently, even while seemingly being still inside this world with those other people that work in the old way. And that's why one can say, hey, wow, your life moves really fast. Or I can't believe how happy you are at this funeral. Or you start to really generate. The more clearly aligned you are with yourself, the more individuated your bubble experience of this collective becomes. And the more of a shiny example it becomes to those that can either match or not match your frequency, your example your light, your brightness. Does that make sense? Now, this bubble reality will start to attract other beings that also have that higher degree of frequency and understanding and alignment with how a source, how consciousness sees things. And so, boom, they will, boom, boom, like water droplets being attracted to each other, turning into a bigger reality until it is the entirety of our civilization. So you've turned your personal bubble that was detached from the collective agreements into the new collective before you know it, at least into a sub-collective. But that can expand and expand into a total collective, and eventually it will, even if not everyone chooses to go along with that, they will form their own sub-collective, you will form your own sub-collective, and these frequencies will depart so far from each other that at some point you won't be able to hear, see, perceive, or experience each other ever again. So your experience will be that the whole civilization has joined you in your revolution, in your understanding. It's not necessarily true. It's simply that others have split up in other sub-collectives that you no longer have the ability per to perceive. So from your, from your point of view, you're on an earth with an enlightened civilization. And there's others that are on an earth with a destructed, destroyed civilization. Every choice is a valid one. Have each being choose for themselves. And the only way you can teach them is by being an example. By living it. Thank you for living it, for being it, and for being here.